Good morning, Facebook. Hello, Facebook. My camera still keeps zooming in on me. So, I'm going to move my computer back a little bit. Let's see. Good morning. Waiting for the notification to go out uh, so that people know that I am live. And it looks like it just went out right there. Do a little sound check. Um, and it didn't pull it up, huh? There we go. All right. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. We got a couple of viewers logging on. Good morning, everybody. It is June 30th. June 30th. Um, July is almost here. Uh, hard to believe. Um, if you're here in New York, we're having some a major heat wave going on right now. Um, but I think it's better than shoveling. I think it's better than shoveling snow, um, especially when it's super, super cold or super wet snow. Um, I'd rather have this versus snow any day. So I'm not complaining. Um, it's a little bit harder or more difficult to go out and run in this kind of weather. Um, I don't mind running in the cold weather at all. Um, in fact, I enjoy running in the cold weather, oddly enough. Uh, 10 degrees, 5 degrees, 15 degrees. I don't mind the cold weather for running because I have proper gear. And when you have the proper gear, um, it makes it easier. So it's not cold. Um, but when it's hot like this, man, oh, man, to go out in the afternoons and just run um, is brutal. Um, Jim and I are going on a bike ride today. Jamie got a new bike yesterday. I'm super excited about that. Um, so she had a, if you know anything about bikes, she got a gravel bike, um, which is, looks like a road bike. Looks, It's a bicycle we're talking about, not a motorcycle. It looks like a road bike, a road bicycle. And um, it's symmetrically designed like a road bike. So it doesn't look like a mountain bike. doesn't look like a hybrid bike. It looks like a road bike, but it has thicker tires, a little more durable. So she can take it on the road still and get some mileage in. So it's geared higher so she won't run out of, out of pedaling. Um, and, uh, but the tires allow it to go to places like Minnewaska on packed gravel, um, through some rail trails, no single path. And she's not going to do that anyway, cause she's, uh, more of a leisure rider than an aggressive rider. So she didn't really need a mountain bike. Um, we looked at a mountain bike and it was overkill for her. Um, she'll enjoy it. So we got to go pick it up today. Uh, we got by Joe fix it's in, um, in, um, well, where, where's Goshen, Goshen. Uh, I've never bought a bike from them before. Um, I usually buy my bikes from Christian Favada up at Table Rock Tours. Um, I've been buying bikes from him for years. And I bought a couple from Dark Horse uh, Cycles, who sold out. Um, didn't like the, the new vibe um, in the, with the new owners there. Just went in there and just didn't quite like the vibe. And, and the new and the new uh, and the old Dark Horse, um, like George Lott, bought a couple bikes from him. And then um, right here in Accord, bought some bikes from Terry. Um, we bought our first round of bikes when the kids were smaller from them. Um, so I just tried to give my distribute my business evenly um, throughout some of the local independent bike shops. Um, but, you know, I really gravitate towards Table Rock Tours, um, Favadas. Up in Rosendale, great guy, um, Christian. And um, I actually went to culinary school with his cousin. Um, so um, that's pretty cool, too. So, um, and let's see. But there's no inventory. If you're going, going, if you're going out to buy a bicycle right now, there is literally the inventory that, that they have is is very very sparse. Um, you're probably going to spend less than you want to because it's either entry level, or you're going to spend far more than you want to because um, bicycles are um, the higher bikes. Uh, it's it's a mid range bikes, right? It's a so the three to five hundred dollar bikes you can find six seven hundred bucks to three thousand dollars. They're almost non-existent. So when you're buying a bike, you either got to spend too little and hopefully that it performs or spend a lot more than you're hopefully going to spend. Um, Jamie got a really good bike. She got a Cervelo. Um, so um, she's got the nicest bike in the family now, which is awesome. So excited to go out and ride that today. Her and I are going to the, go do some rail trails today. So super excited about that. Um, but good morning, everybody tuning in. Hi, Susan. Hi, Linda. Hi, Holly. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm going to talk about something about wine today. You might not know or realize or maybe have not put a thought thought process into this. Um, so white wine, red wine, rosé wine. Um, white wine, red wine, rosé wine. And we're going to talk about what actually makes wine that color. Because a lot of people think that, oh, you just juice white wine, white grapes, and you get white wine. And you just juice dark grapes and you get dark wine. Well, that's actually not the case. Um, and then some people think rosé is a mixture of white and red wine. You just blend it together. 
And that's not the case. However, that can be the case. You can make rosé like that, but typically rosé is not made like that. So imagine juicing. Let me just make an analogy. Imagine juicing fresh oranges. Now, we all know that oranges are orange on the outside. You juice it, and the juice comes out orange. But imagine juicing oranges, and, and the juice comes out clear. And to get the juice, the orange color, you have to take all the skins of the oranges and soak them into the orange juice, into the clear orange juice to turn it orange. Imagine if you had to do that. You'd be like, wow, this is pretty like tricky and intricate and like why, why this doesn't make sense, right? An orange supposed to the color, the color's orange. It just comes to, well, grapes, see, a dark-skinned grape will juice clear. Um, a white-skinned grape will, of course, juice white. Um, so, for example, champagne... The grapes that go in the champagne um, can be red grapes, but it makes white champagne. Unless you're buying Blanc de Blanc, which is white on white, Chardonnay grapes, uh, Pinot Meunier and Pinot Noir are two red skin grapes that actually go into champagne. But when you juice a red skin grape, typically you get white juice. So remember juicing an orange? If the orange came out clear, you'd be like, oh, wow, what's going on here? So red skin grapes typically juice clear. Typically, that's not the case. Like I'm holding a bottle of Saparavi right here, um, which is actually dark fleshed and dark skinned. And this is a rosé. Um, this is from the Finger Lake Saparavi um, being a, a really awesome grape. And if you've not explored Saparavi, um, do so. Uh, it usually makes red wine. Um, this right here is a rosé version. Uh, Saparavi will not make white uh, wine at all. But a lot of these red grapes that look red will actually make white wine. Um, but indeed, the vintners use them for red wines. So... Um, how he's saying leaving the skins on. So it's all about skin contact. So when you're hanging around somebody who is drinking wine and they're talking about rosé wines, the terminology is skin contact. So now Saparavi is very, very unusual. Saparavi, you just juice it and it's dark and you do no skin contact because it's dark on dark. But for example, if you wanted to make Cabernet Franc rosé, you would juice the Cabernet Franc, the juice would come out white, and you take the skins the skins and you throw the skins into the juice after it's juiced and this is called skin contact and you start the, the the initial fermentation with the skins on 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 the juice on this on the grape juice and that soaking in there will dye the wine its color now if you're making cabernet franc and making it red there's lots of skin contact and it goes in there and that that's what you make the wine with but if you're making rosé rosé of cabernet franc you might leave the skins on for two hours you might leave the skins on for 24 hours onto the juice and then extract the skins and then finish the fermentation process. So that right there is what makes rosé wine rosé. And this is why you can make white wine, typically champagne, white champagne from red grapes because there's no skin contact. It's juiced. Now, however, Saparavi, one of the exceptions, dark on dark, this has zero skin contact. So the juice comes out dark. Now, if you put the skins on here for even 24 hours, this wine is going to be much darker. Um, so Saparavi is an interesting grape. It's from Georgia. It's from the country of Georgia. It's one of the world's oldest grapes. And it's making its mark in the Finger Lakes. Um, McGregor Vineyards was the first vineyard in New York many, many years ago. McGregor Vineyards is 50 years old um, to bring Saparavi in. So every Saparavi that you see up in the Finger Lakes came from McGregor Vineyards. Um, he kind of figured out that this was a grape to grow up in the Finger Lakes, cold region, just like Georgia, the country of Georgia. Um, but th this has thousands of years of history, Saparavi. Um, really interesting grape. Big, bold grape. If you like big, bold red wines, Saparavi is it. And you take Saparavi, you blend it with a little Cabernet from up there, or Cabernet Franc, um, Merlot, and you have this amazing big, bold wine, or 100% Saparavi. In fact, McGregor makes a two-year and a three-year reserve Saparavi reds that are like powerhouse, powerhouse red wines. They're probably some of the biggest red wines I've drank out of New York State, um, besides Damiani's um, reserve wine. Damiani makes a great reserve wine from Cabernet, um, only on certain years when Cabernet has, has the intensity it needs uh, for them. So that is, folks, how wines are typically colored. They're colored from the skin contact, not the, not the juice that actually comes out of it. So... Just thought I'd say that because a lot of people, when they hear that, they're like, oh, I didn't know that. And, and that's something probably most people never even think about. Why would you put any thought process into something like that um, if you're not like a really wine geek or nerd or connoisseur or, or like, you know, um, 
that kind of stuff. If you've gone on, if you've gone on any of our trips with us, whether it's been to Italy or Spain or to the Finger Lakes, you will hear that term a lot: skin contact when the rosés. Um, our trips are our trips are awesome because most most vineyards we go to, the owner comes out and does a trip, or uh, the trip, the uh, the tour, or somebody high up. It's just not a regular tour guide doing doing it. Um, if the regular tour guide does it, typically the owner will join in and um, <laughs> and help out or, and, you know, give their personal touch with us because we know all the owners. So um, when you're touring with us and you'll hear the vintners, the winemakers, the owners talk about skin contact, you'll hear them talk about lees, which is the yeast, how long the wines, the Chardonnays and stuff are left on the lees, batonage. There's a bunch of really cool terms that you'll learn that you never knew before by just joining us on a wine tour. If you want to join us, um, our wine tours, uh, we have the Finger Lakes coming up and Long Island coming up this fall. We're booking for that. And then uh, next April, Italy, um, which we're kind of sold out for. I'm trying to, trying to see if they'll release more seats for us uh, in Italy. Right now, we're only allowed to do 12 people per, per trip. Um, Jamie and I are 14, uh, 13 and 14, and our tour guide Luigi is number 15. So kind of small groups in Italy still uh, for COVID restrictions. Uh, even though Italy is open and they're open for business, um, they still have some guidelines that uh, that they're that they're in pl- placing them like that. But that's probably going to change very soon, right? So um, as everything's opening up, um, let's see. We have a champagne, a New York champagne dinner coming up July fifth, and we're going to send some information out on an email today. It's super limited. Um, I'll be shucking oysters, uh, searing off some scallops in the garden. Um, it's a really really awesome event. Uh, we're featuring four New York champagnes, quote unquote champagnes. We're not allowed to call them champagnes. We can call them traditional method or method champenoise. See, champagne has a trademark on their wine, as do most other regions of the world. All those, whether the term it's Brunello or Bernolo or Bordeaux, um, they're trademarked by the by the governmental associations that oversee the quality standards that these these areas are making. So, if you're making wine in Champagne which is going to be champagne sparkling, you have to follow some, you have to, um, hold on one second. You have to um, follow the government guidelines. Following the government guidelines will ensure that they're representing champagne properly, just like Dijon mustard has to, you have to follow the traditional method of making Dijon mustard. Same thing with prosciutto de Parma, prosciutto de San Daniele. So um, champagne has to um, go through all these rigorous standards. So they like their quality of products. Um, they're expensive. So when somebody else in another wine region says, hey, we have champagne here, Champagne's like, oh, no, you don't have champagne. And they are notorious for putting their lawyers out and protecting their trademark. And it's totally understandable because then everybody would be using the word champagne. And they've actually won in court and gone after people um, who have put the word champagne. So the word terminology is called traditional method or method champenoise. Traditional method means that it's bottle fermented. Everything's done in the bottle. Um, all the magic happens, the yeast and the, the bubbles all happen all there. So... Um, we're doing all New York stuff now. New York stuff um, is making amazing, amazing traditional methods. Um, between the knowledge, the winemakers that are coming in, the grapes are growing, the terroir up there, a little bit of climate change, um, things are happening up in the Finger Lakes and Long Island. The Finger Lakes and Long Island uh, for for method champenoises that are mind blowing. These people are some of these vintners are vineyards are making traditional method champagnes and taking their product to Champagne France and winning medals over Champagne. So that's how good a lot of our stuff is here. And I just impressed a friend of mine the other night who, who has one of the Grand Award wine lists um, from Wine Spectator. 97 restaurants in the world um, are deemed a Grand Award winner. Uh, very selected few, and there's only five in New York City and uh, maybe even four in New York City. I'm not sure, but that's uh, he turned him onto a bottle of Ravine's Blanc de Blanc, or the, the, no, the Ravine's Brut, and he was so impressed with it. He was like, I can't believe this is being made in New York. Um, so, folks, New York is really coming up uh, a lot of reasons. Today's email is going to talk about all that, so that'll be out soon. Uh, but if you want to come to Monday's dinner uh, for champagnes, or method champenois, and oysters and scallops, it's $49 a person. It's more than most because um, more expensive wine, and I'll be out there shucking oysters and scallops, which is more expensive than we've done in the past. So that's the story of that, 
and um, we'll talk to everybody later. Everybody have an amazing day, um, and hopefully we'll be able to get back and do a Facebook Live later. Uh, Jamie will be able to do her cocktail time with Jamie. I tasted some really cool things yesterday that we're bringing in, some new products uh, that are local uh, that we're bringing in. Uh, Jamie did a tasting yesterday. Uh, or video yesterday, live yesterday, because we were with a, a rep tasting some new products. So it was really cool. All right, folks, have an amazing day, and we'll talk to you later.